We are all gathered here today to listen to an expert talk session on radio astronomy research and advanced instrumentation by our guest, Dr. Anish Roshi, sir. Conducted by the Electronics and Communication Department in association with IETE and IEEE CAS Society. Let's begin our session with a silent prayer. I request you all to stand up. Thank you. Now, I cordially invite our beloved principal, Dr. T.A. Shaul Hamid, sir, to welcome the gathering. Honorable guest of the day, Dr. Anish Roshi, my dear faculty colleagues, dear student friends. It's indeed a matter of very high privilege, deep privilege and pleasure for me to stand before you in this evening. Uh, Dr. Anish Roshi is a, it's not that he's a friend of mine. He is one year senior to me in this college in 1988. He was in 88 batch and I was, I belong to 89 batch. And, uh, and uh, he was one year senior to me. At that time, you see, there were 25 students in electronics and communication. So, so the, the people who study electronics and communication, all the four years, we had known each other. That time, even that time, he was marked for his uh, remarkable sparks in many, many areas like applied electromagnetic theory and on. He was a rebel during his studies. During his student days, I do remember he was a rebel. And uh, uh, later, after graduation, he joined uh, in you know, in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, where only pure physicists were working in astronomy, he just rushed in and uh, he graduated from there. He took his doctorate from TAFR, and uh, he worked as a faculty there for a while. Then he moved to uh, for his postdoctoral studies in National Radio Astronomy Observatory, United States. Then he came back and uh, I do remember he worked as a faculty in Raman Institute in Bangalore. So he was, he is uh, now, uh, plenty of publications he is having. His citations are more than 1500 and H index is around 20. And, uh, and uh, a world renowned scientist in astronomy. So as the head of the institution, not as a friend, as the head of the institution, I am very proud of him. Uh, because he is back to our campus, not the first time, second time. When I was a professor in Electronics and Communication Engineering Department, we have arranged a talk of Roshi years back. I don't remember, it was in 2016 or 17, Roshi. So it was in 2017, I think. So uh, the way it was received by our students and, uh, and, and many years later also, some students shared that uh, the, the, the spark he made in the talk and uh, See, not that uh, he, is, he is an eloquent speaker, no, uh, but he is, he is, he is, his stuff and, uh, and, uh, and his depth attracts uh, really intelligent people. So, look, uh, plenty of uh, the astronomy, there is a field, Prabancham, Ennaparayinna, Adinda, Nigodhadagal, Adinapetiyulla, Chinda, Adha, the galaxy, Kuruchulla, Chinda. Adinda minute aspects na kuruchu, adinda stability akuruchu la na madu ulkanta. We know all these things. See, a scientist who is, who the namalda kuda padichayal, namal odopam sanjarichayal, angane oru sthana tirikyumbo, sabhaiga eta namakku dhonan eru sandosham undu. A sandosham ane nikke dhingalda mumbil nikkumbo lullat. Uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Roshi that he, he came back, I mean accepting my invitation, he came over and uh, and uh, he is he is he, he is here for a talk. So, on behalf of all who gathered here, and on behalf of the TKM College of Engineering Fraternity, I I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Anish Roshi. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Professor Anuas is uh, she is the she is heading our student activities and uh, IET. So, a dynamic teacher, an excellent teacher in Electronics and Communication Engineering Department. She took all the pain in this hectic schedule. I welcome uh, 
Dr. Professor Anuasis and my learned colleagues, Professor Sajina, Professor Vishnu, Professor Shabir, and all my learned colleagues and uh, all my student friends. I welcome all my student friends and, and try to explore whatever things possible in this talk and uh, don't hesitate to ask him uh, ask questions, post questions on him. However small, sometimes we feel our questions are foolish or silly. Don't, don't think like that. See, uh, you must pose your questions. Namaka valare vidh parama vidhita varikya onda jyaan chodhikya nilla enna vijayarikya rado. Ella vidhita ngalum enna namaka thonanna kariyangal chodhichana logam inna tiyadu. Namaka ananna ivide tiyadu itaram chodhiyangal lode yana. Chodhiyangal ningal chodhikya nam Ennu lala, orang apa itu saya anak kute kalau orang, adi apa orang orang ini ke parai orang lala. Once again, I welcome you all and 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 with a lot of love and respects, I I welcome Dr. Roshi to deliver his talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Today, we have with us as our guest, Dr. Anish Roshi, sir, Senior Scientist and Head of Astronomy at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, United States, to share with us his ex expert knowledge on radio astronomy and advanced instrumentation. I wholeheartedly welcome, sir, onto the dais to deliver the talk session. Going to the details of my talk, let me thank uh, uh, Professor Shahul and Professor Anu uh, for arranging this talk. And it's a great privilege for me to give this talk in the college where I have studied my undergraduate. Um, so today I will be talking about uh, radio astronomy research. Uh, so I will briefly introduce what radio astronomy is because I'm, not, I'm sure many of you may not be familiar with what radio astronomy is. Then I will briefly talk about uh, uh, the research topic which I am, um, uh, uh, which is my area of expert or which I am concentrating on right now. And then I will talk about uh, some instrumentation aspects. <coughs> so the talk is broadly divided into three different topics. The first one is basics of radio astronomy, so th which will give you an introduction of what radio astronomy is and so on. Then I'll talk about the interstellar medium and uh, my field of uh, uh, expertise is interstellar medium studies. And I also uh, spend a considerable part of my time developing instruments. So I will talk about two of them, which is an ongoing development work. <coughs> uh, to start with, uh, yeah. we, um, we know the atmosphere is opaque to most of the most of the electromagnetic radiation. This plot shows uh, uh, the opacity as a function of wavelength. Okay, uh, so most of the uh, atmosphere is opaque to most of the electromagnetic radiation. So if if it, uh, if it is hundred percent, none of the radiation comes all the way to the ground. And there are some windows here. Um, do you want to turn this off? Uh, there are some windows here where the uh, radiation, I mean the opacity of the atmosphere is minimal. Okay? And one of them is the well-known um, uh, wavelength range which is the optical wavelength and most of the astronomy is done in those wavelengths uh, traditionally. Okay? Um, but if you go to lower and lo larger and larger wavelength which is uh, uh, lower and lower frequency, there is another window here, where uh, the uh, which is the radio wavelength range, and the atmosphere is completely um, optically thin, or uh, uh, the radiation can come all the way down to the ground uh, through this window. And radio astronomers basically try to study the celestial objects in this frequency range. Okay. Um, now, the frequency range uh, the radio astronomers use is something like 10 megahertz all the way to about 10 to the power of 12, megahertz, 12 hertz. 
okay although it is uh, um, optically thin or the opacity is very low there is uh, some amount of opacity which i will uh, uh, briefly mention later and at frequencies below 10 megahertz the um, ionosphere becomes optically thick so therefore the radiations cannot come all the way to the ground okay so this is the window which uh, uh, we are using mostly from the ground uh, do you understand uh, and if you want to observe at frequencies outside this window you have to either you either use spacecraft or you have to ha have telescope set in moon for example and people are seriously thinking about uh, having an observatory built in moon <laughs> So, uh, radio astronomy is basically a s study of celestial objects in the radio frequency range, the frequency range which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, and almost all celestial objects emit radio waves, but the intensity of the wave emitted at different frequency depends on the actual physical mechanism which is uh, producing that radiation. For example, if you take sun, uh, most of the radiation you see is in uh, optical band, but there is some amount of radiation coming in radio uh, because sun is a nearby object uh, sun is very strong in radio but not because it's intrinsically strong it is only because sun is nearby but there are other mechanisms which may produce very strong radio radiation uh, for example the uh, accretion of material by a black hole that produces very strong radio radiation <laughs> And uh, typically the flux density of the radiation, I will come to what flux density means in the next, next slide, is about 10 to the power of minus 26 in these units, watts per meter square per hertz. And this is called one Jansky, um, honoring the first discovery of radio emission from celestial object by Carl Jansky in 1932. Okay. Um, now, if you want to compare this uh, intensi uh, this flux density with the uh, radiation produced by a cell phone, um, if you leave a cell phone in Mars, um, the, inten the flux density of that ra radiation from that cell phone is about 10,000 times stronger than the radiation from any celestial object. Okay. So you can imagine how weak are the radiation from the celestial object. So, uh, so there, because this is very weak, uh, we need very sensitive radio antennas and receivers to, to detect the signals from the celestial objects. So, so, so one of the requirements is sensitivity and one way of increasing the sensitivity of an antenna. So uh, these radiations can be uh, picked up by a radio antenna. So one of the ways to increase the sensitivity of the radio antennas which you would have learned in your course is to increase the collecting area of the antenna. To, um, to understand that, let's, uh, let's look at the definition of this uh, flux density. So if you have a, a cell phone uh, or a, um, any ra radiation, a radio source which uh, radiates some power P, um, that radiation expands spherically outside and at some distance R, the flux per or the power per unit um, unit area per unit hertz is called the flux density of the flux density of the source. So as you can see, as the distance increases, the flux density reduces as as one over r square, and um, and that that is one of the reasons the radio radio signals from celestial objects are very very weak because the distance involved is very large. Okay, so. So if you have a radiation with the flux density of s, uh, uh, and if you have a telescope at this distance r with receiving this radiation, um, then the total power received by the radio by the telescope is the flux density times the area of the telescope. It's you can think this as a, a uh, the telescope as a bucket collecting the photons. And if you have more, um, if you have a bigger bucket, it collects more photons. So effectively, essentially, the effective area of the telescope, if you increase it, it collects more photons, and therefore you you, you will receive more power at the output of the telescope. Okay. Um, 
because the flux density of the tel uh, radio sources are extremely weak, you, you therefore need very large collecting area for the telescope to have uh, increased sensitivity or to receive the signals from the celestial ob objects. So that is one one aspect. The second aspect, which uh, you may not have, you may not know, the other part you would have studied in in your radar class, for example. Uh, that is, uh, if you increase the collecting area of the of your uh, transmitter or receiver, your sensitivity increases. That's what basically the first first thing which I said. The second part is. Uh, uh, the noise produced by the system itself, your own, the amplifiers and other things which are in your system itself. So, to understand that, if you take a resistor uh, and uh, without any um, voltage source or anything, you take the output of the resistance and connect it to a very sensitive oscilloscope, you will see these voltage fluctuations produced by this resistance. Okay, the mean value of that voltage will be zero. That essentially means that there is no current flow in this. But instantaneously, the charge distribution in this re resistance uh, will fluctuate. That is because of the temperature of the resistance. Okay, and the spectral density of this uh, this noise, that is power per unit frequency, is is a function of the temperature of that uh, temperature of that resistance. So this is a this is a uh, result by Nyquist, uh, the same, same uh, um, Nyquist who has, uh, um, you, you would have encountered in sampling theorem. So he derived that the spectral density of the noise, it depends only on the temperature of that noise. It doesn't depends on, it depends on the resistor or any other factor in the, uh, factor in that resistance. So if you, if you have an amplifier here, at the focus of the telescope, so this is the parabolic reflector. The signal from the um, from the celestial source gets reflected and focused at the focus of the parabola, and you will keep a dipole or a, a, a horn feed at the um, at the focus, like 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 your um, satellite antenna receiver, and then you will connect to an amplifier. So all these systems, uh, if you uh, typically are kept at the room temperature, which is about 300 Kelvin or so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the noise produced by a 300 Kelvin resistance is about uh, about 40 times larger than one of the strongest source in the uh, source in the sky with a 220 meter telescope. Okay. So if you want to reduce this noise, one way is to cool these amplifiers. Uh, to uh, typically we cool it to something like 20 Kelvin or so. Okay. So there are two things that has to be done to improve the sensitivity. One is you have to make bigger telescopes. Second is you have to make very sensitive receivers. So you have to cool the receivers. One way is to cool the receivers so that the noise produced by the uh, receivers are minimum. So there are uh, many telescopes which exist in the world um, which has these properties. For example, this telescope ha in Green Bank has, uh, has a size of about uh, 100 meters. And this is an off-axis parabola. You would have seen similar structure for your uh, um, TV antennas. And this is a symmetric parabola, similar to the conventional TV antenna, but the size of that telescope is about uh, 100 meter or so. This is in Germany. And both these telescopes operate uh, uh, up to below 100, 100 gigahertz or so. Okay. Uh, there are other types of telescopes. Uh, uh, for example, if you if you have uh, telescopes much bigger than 100 meters, you may not able to rotate it. So uh, there is a telescope built in China, which has a diameter of about 500 meters or so, and the reflector is completely uh, reflector is not movable. It is, is it is kept in a um, crater. <coughs> Um, and the feed, the, the element which is receiving the signal from the reflector is hanging somewhere on the top and you move the reflector to track the source in the sky. And uh, there was a similar telescope in US. Okay, for some reason all these are messed up and, and, and I don't know why it happened. Um, sorry about that. 
uh, this is the Arecibo telescope, which is a, has a diameter of about uh, 300 meters. Okay, and the feed uh, is located inside this uh, dome, and the feed used to move back and forth and uh, rotate around this to look at different positions in the sky. <coughs> In this case, the entire telescope rotates to look at different positions in the sky. In this case, only the field will move around to, um, to uh, position, uh, I mean, to point the telescope in different directions in the sky. And I will come back to this telescope later because I have put a date of about 2020. So the telescope collapsed in 2020 and I will come back to that later. Um, in India also we have uh, very big telescopes, for example this is, an Uti this is a telescope in Uti, um, it is a 500 meter long telescope, it is a cylindrical parabolic telescope and width of this uh, cylindrical parabola is about 30 meters or so. And this operates about at 307 fre megahertz frequency, just one frequency. Okay, so far I concentrated on the uh, sensitivity or the uh, uh, how to detect weak signal, but astronomers also require angular resolution. So, if, uh, for example, if you take Mars, its diameter is about 7,000 7, kilometers and it's at a di distance about 100 million kilometers, let's say. So, the angular size substantive by Mars is about 15 arc second or so. So, if you take a typical telescope, the telescope has a beam and you cannot resolve objects within the beam, okay? So, the beam of the telescope depends on the wavelength and the diameter. It's a ratio of the wavelength divided by the diameter. Um, so, if you take uh, a 10 gigahertz operation, the wavelength is about 0.03 meters. And if you, even if you take a diameter of about 100 meters, uh, the size of the beam is about 60 arc seconds or so. It, it cannot resolve this uh, object in the sky or if you, if you want to, if you are trying to make an image of that object using this telescope, you cannot make it. Okay? Because the object is smaller than the beam of the telescope. <laughs> Um, the beam of the telescope, uh, is, you might have learned about the uh, power pattern of a, uh, of a telescope in, in your um, electromagnetic class. So, uh, the power pattern is essentially uh, power as a function of angle in the sky and half the width, the half power width of that uh, beam pattern is what is called the, called the uh, we call it as the resolution of the telescope. There is a small factor which will come about 1.22 but uh, typically the uh, half power width is what we take it as the um, resolution of the telescope and as I said even if you take the Arecibo, uh, I mean uh, a telescope of diameter about 220 meters. Um, Three, at 327 and 1.4 gigahertz, the uh, the beam width, that is the half hour beam width of the telescope is about in arc minutes. Uh, but the celest celestial object you want to image is typically much smaller than the smaller than the size of that beam. <coughs> um, so the technique which we use in in radio astronomy is not to build a much larger and larger telescope to get the angular resolution. Rather, we build an array of telescope. And these are, these are called radio interferometers. The, uh, the way it works is like exactly like the, uh, the CT scan uh, uh, imaging technique where you, uh, in CT scan, you don't directly measure, measure the image using uh, uh, X-rays, but you measure the opacity of the object through which the x-ray passes and then inverts that to ma make an image. So we use a similar technique to uh, create the images of radio, uh, I mean radio sources. Okay. This is a telescope uh, in the US, it's called the very large array. Uh, each of the telescope has a diameter of about 25 meter or so and there are about uh, 27 such antennas and you can move these antennas up to 35 kilometers or so. So, so this, uh, this work like a telescope of diameter about 35 kilometers or so. And this particular telescope operates up to 50 gigahertz or so. Uh, you would have 
read in newspapers recently about uh, uh, imaging this uh, black hole in the center of our galaxy and this imaging was done by a similar technique uh, it's called the very long baseline interferometer it basically is an array sorry a array of antennas but the antennas are located at different uh, co uh, different continents okay some of the antennas are in us some of them are in europe one antenna in uh, um, uh, somewhere in the South Pole, okay, and this is the image they made using the network of these antennas uh, operating like like an interferometer. And the, in uh, India also we have interferometer, the giant meter wave radio telescope in Pune is one of the largest interferometers in the world. Uh, it operates up to 1.4 gigahertz from 500 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz. Each of these antenna has a diameter of about uh, 45 meter or so and they are spread spread around something like 25 kilometers okay so it's equivalent to, equivalent to making a, a antenna of 25 kilometer in diameter so uh, um, th so that's the first part of my talk so now i will uh, uh, go into the interstellar medium part um, so if you Look at the sky, if it is a clear sky, you can see this sort of dusty patch in the sky which is, uh, which is the plane of the Milky Way. Okay? And uh, if you look at the attenuation produced by the dust as a function of inverse of the wavelength, you will see that the attenuation comes, uh, uh, reduces as you go to longer and longer wavelengths. It is similar to uh, the Rayleigh, I mean partly similar to the Rayleigh scattering where if you, uh, if you go to longer wavelength the scattering is small. Okay, so, uh, so if you go all the way to radio then there is hardly any attenuation because of dust in the, in, in the interstellar medium. I mean these are the medium, the, the, uh, I mean if you look at the sky there are stars and between the stars there is a medium which is called the interstellar medium and that that medium has uh, uh, different components and one of the components are dust uh, dust in that medium and that dust produces this attenuation okay uh, so if you look at the if you try to image something or try to look at some some object behind the dust uh, in optical wavelength you may not able to see that but in radio wavelengths because the attenuation is uh, uh, minimum uh, you could actually see through the entire galaxy okay so that is one of the advantage of the ra uh, radio observations uh, 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 in ra radio astronomy also uses uh, um, uh, spectral lines to study this interstellar medium this spectral lines are nothing but an excess emission in s certain frequency range okay it can be either in emission or it can be absorption and one good thing about the spectral lines is that you can use them to determine the Doppler frequency or the relative motion between the emitter and the absorber, which is, the, which is like the Doppler shift. And that Doppler shift can be used to uh, determine the distance to the objects, okay, in the case of our galaxy. Um, and in addition, that these spectral lines are very useful tool to uh, um, derive the properties of the medium which is producing those spectral lines. <coughs> and one of the very important spectral line which uh, as, uh, radio astronomers use is called the H1 21 centimeter line. Um, you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you are all familiar with the uh, Bohr atom model. So if you, if you take the uh, Bohr atom model, n is equals to 1, the principal quantum number, n is equals to 1, um, orbit is somewhere here and n is equals to 2 is here. The transition from n is equals to 2 to n is equals to 1 is called the Lyman alpha transition. So the transition from higher quantum states to uh, n is equals to 1 are the Lyman series. Uh, transition from higher quantum states to n is equals to 2 are the Balmer series, which you would have learned in your uh, physics class. But what you haven't learned is that uh, uh, is that there is a energy state of this n is equals to 1 state. Uh, there are two energy states for n is equals to 1, which actually occurs because uh, the nucleus of hydrogen has a spin. Okay. The, uh, the nucleus of the hydrogen is due to protons and proton has a half spin. And the, 
the revolving electron at n is equal to one state also has a uh, half spin. <coughs> this spin can be associated with a magnetic moment of those particles, and so the mag the, so you can think that these two magnets are inter interacting, and that magnetic interaction will produce a, uh, a, t a hyperfine transition for the ground state of the uh, ground state of the hydrogen atom, and if when the electron makes a flip from spin parallel state to spin anti-parallel state, it produces a photon which is at 1.4 gigahertz or 21 centimeter. <coughs> so, uh, so because the universe is filled with hydrogen, uh, hydrogen is the most abundant material, this is a very important transition to study the celestial objects. <coughs> The other molecular trans uh, other spectral line transition which we use is because of uh, CO naturally uh, in the in uh, um, celestial objects uh, uh, the carbon monoxide can be s observed and the rotation of the carbon monoxide because it's a quantum mechanical system it is uh, uh, it is quantized and so the when when it makes transition from um, one rotational state to the other rotational state, it produces a series of line and the lowest uh, transition occurs at 115 gigahertz or so. <coughs> and astronomers use this transition to study the molecular component of this interstellar media. <coughs> and the third one which I, I mostly use is what is called the radio recombination lines. These are identical to the Lehman Alpha and uh, Balmer, Balmer series, but uh, the transition occurs at very high quantum states. For example, if you if you take uh, a principal transition from principal quantum number 272 to 271, it produces a photon at two uh, 325 megahertz. Okay. So uh, these transitions are uh, occurring in a uh, fully ionized gas <coughs> and therefore the uh, radio recombination lines are very good uh, tracers of ionized gas. Okay? They can be used to study the properties of the ionized gas, fully ionized gas. In the previous case, this can be used for studying the molecular component of the interstellar medium and this can be used to study the um, atomic component of the industrial media. <coughs> so, uh, th there are a lot of studies that has been done with this uh, molecular, these atomic and molecular as well as recombination and transitions and what we now know is that the, our galaxy is not a, um, not, not a symbol disk, but it has spiral structures. And, and the medium between the stars are mostly of um, hydrogen at atom. This, the major fraction is atomic hydrogen. And some fraction is molecular, about 17%. And the other part is about uh, um, <coughs> completely ionized material. Okay. And if you look at the, um, uh, this is the view of the galaxy from, when you look at the galaxy from the top, but if you're looking at from the side, uh, this is the sort of uh, structure you will see. The most of the material is close to the disk of the galaxy. This is about 100 parsec in uh, uh, thickness. And mo all these different components are well mixed in, 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 in the disk of the galaxy. Okay. And <coughs> The important thing is that uh, this interstellar medium, which it consists of these different components, they are not uh, sta uh, they are not static. It's a dynamic system. So it it starts with ionized gas, then convert it into atomic gas, and then it will convert it into molecular gas. And uh, from the molecular gas, stars are formed, and these stars will. <coughs> distract the material around it and again ionized gas will form and see this dynamics is very important to understand the evolution of our galaxy okay. 
but uh, my most of my interest start to study this ionized gas uh, as well as the transition from atomic to molecular gas how this molecular gas is forming uh, uh, how the molecular clouds are forming and <coughs> i am also interested in um, studying the formation of stars from this molecular cloud okay we can discuss more about it uh, um, maybe after this i am not going into the details of what specifically i am going to study <coughs> so m maybe i'll now go to the third part of my talk which is which is what probably most of you will be interested in <coughs> which is the radio astronomy instrumentation now um i said we have um uh, uh, we could observe in all the radio wavelengths that are accessible to uh, accessible to earth that is the opacity of the atmosphere is minimum but that is not strictly true because all these commercial <coughs> services like mobile phone and other people would like to use the same radio wavelength so we have to share the spectrum with them okay so this uh, um so the so the mobile and other services produces radio frequency interference to for our observation so when we try to look at signals from the sky these mobile phones as well as other uh, um, radio transmission um, uh, for example wifi and so on uh, will be picked up by the ra radio telescope and one of the technological uh, work which we are doing is to try to see whether we can um, we can separate out the signals from the astronomical source from the from this radio interference and the technique we are planning to use is something similar to what uh, uh, <coughs> what is used in communication what you call as the adaptive cancellation you would have uh, heard about um, this uh, headphones which adaptively cancel the noise coming from the from uh, from elsewhere and you will you, you will listen only to the music which is played through through your device right it's a similar technique we are trying to use so we have this radio uh, telescope which is receiving signals from the celestial objects and there is a set of other reference antennas which are picking up signals from the re re the interfering sources like the mobile phone or wifi and other things and uh, what we are trying to do is to take this signal and try to adaptively cancel the signals pro signals the interfering signals using the signals picked up by these reference antenna so that's the basic idea and the uh, device which we are building right now right now is a silence based card it has an analog system which amplifies the signals from both the reference antenna as well as the telescope and we have a silings card uh, it's the laser silings chip uh, um, the rf soc chip and you connect the output of that through a 100 gigabit ethernet to a gpu cluster okay so the signals coming from here which uh, uh, which consist of both the uh, signals from the telescope as well as the reference antenna they are all passed through this and there are so, um, uh, we are developing our own software to suppress the interfering interfering signal and to extract the radio astronomy signal uh, so the, all those things will be done in the gpu cluster uh so finally i want to uh, say about some new antenna development which we are, which we are involved in um, this is in relation with the arecibo telescope um, as i said earlier the arecibo telescope had ha is a 305 meter uh, reflecting telescope which which is kept in a crater and the structure which is at the focus which receives the signals are hanging uh, on cables Uh, supported by these towers of height about 100 meters or so um i am not going into the details of the optics but in 2020 um, december this telescope collapsed uh, i'm sorry i didn't prepare a, uh, the, there was a video of the collapse in the youtube i thought i will show that uh, but i don't think you have set it up for that right the other video is that okay uh, 
So anyway, the tele telescope completely collapsed, and it is uh, uh, the structure is there, uh, no more there. The only the part of the reflector is there. So we are uh, actively working on getting funds for rebuilding this telescope. And um, one thing which I haven't mentioned about Arecibo, Arecibo Observatory is that Arecibo Observatory has three research groups. One is radio astronomy. The other one is uh, planetary science. Their idea is to use this Arecibo telescope to uh, detect the reflected signal from near-Earth orbits, the near-Earth orbits which are coming and hitting us, I mean possibly coming and hitting us. It's called the planetary defense. Uh, so one of the group's interest is to uh, determine the orbital parameters of the objects which are coming towards Earth and the most precise uh, determination of velocity and orbital parameters were done using the Arecibo telescope, so which is no longer there. So we want that facility to be uh, restored. <coughs> the third, as a third group in the observatory is called the um, atmospheric group. Their interest is to study the properties of the ionosphere. So they transmit the. They were using this telescope to transmit the signal at 430 megahertz or so to uh, excite, the, excite the ionosphere and study the properties of the ionosphere. So the new telescope which we want to build should have about 5 megawatt of transmitting for, for the planetary science and about, uh, um, it has gone outside this, about uh, 10 megawatt of pulse transmission for the uh, atmospheric group and the radio astronomers want to extend the frequency all the way up to 30 gigahertz or so and all of them want as much collecting area as possible so we uh, we decided we will keep the collecting a total collecting area equivalent to about 300 meter diameter dish okay and the uh, idea which we have come up with is a new concept which is which we call it the next generation arecibo telescope ngat it's uh, instead of having a set of individually rotating dishes like in the interferometer we have uh, all these dishes, uh, these, these are the um, uh, top view of those dishes, they are all kept in a plate and this entire plate will be rotated, uh, uh, rotated up and down to point the telescope in different directions in the sky. Okay? And a closest example, uh, 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 there is no large scale facility that has been built in this way. Uh, the closest example which we could find is a, uh, is a telescope built for cosmic microwave background study which is, uh, uh, so each of these are dish small small dishes, there are gaps between, uh, between this dish, in our case we cannot afford those gaps, the uh, reflectors should be as compact as possible, so, but this is an, uh, one of the examples uh, and there is a, um, the mechanical engineers have provided a CAD video how this telescope operates <laughs> so i can and that is the elevation motion of the uh, telescope and um, in this structure there is no blockage between the Different, uh, different segments. Okay, that, that is one of the important things which we want. We, we were trying to uh, design it in a single plane, but the mechanical engineering group uh, said that this may be a more efficient way to realize that. Okay. So, I, I, I don't see the last slide here, sorry. I, I, uh, uh, so the last slide there shows essentially the if we could complete the building of that telescope, that will be the best telescope in the world in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, sensitivity, in terms of the transmitting power, both for planetary as well as the um, atmospheric science. So maybe we'll stop there and then start the discussion. I mean, we can discuss more about the different telescopes and whatever I have talked about.